Three minutes to the biggest battle of our professional lives all comes down to today. Either we heal as a team or we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen. Believe me. And we can stay here, get the shit kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell. One inch at a time. Now, I can't do it for you. I'm too old. I look around, I see these young faces, and I think, I mean, I made every wrong choice a middle-aged man can make. I, uh, I pissed away all my money, believe it or not. I chased off anyone who's ever loved me. And lately, I can't even stand the face I see in America. <clears throat> you know, when you get old in life, things get taken from you. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, Life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Hell yeah. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. <laughs> On this team, we fight for that itch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that itch. We claw with our fingernails for that itch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning and losing. fight. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now, I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're going to see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're going to do the same for him. That's a team, gentlemen. And either we heal now as a team, or we will die as individuals. That's football, guys. That's all it is. Now, what are you going to do? <laughs>
<laughs> All right, guys. Sorry, I forgot to unmute the button. Uh, we, can we hear me now? Is that good? Somebody give me a... All right. So we're back. Thanks, guys. I'm back. Sorry. Technology with OGs doesn't always work so good. But uh, let's go. <laughs> My energy is back, guys. I was a little off this week because the gym was closed. But we have really big things in the works on this channel. And we have a really big show for you tonight. I can feel a charge running through my veins. Other than last week, this is how I felt for the last five years. As some of you know, it was then that I was given a challenging diagnosis. But there really can be a silver lining in almost anything. And for me, the diagnosis charged me with energy. I started and finished a normal. I've done screenplays, launched websites, and of course, YouTube channels. I work on things at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Maybe none of it will pan out. You can see that. But carpe diem, seize the day. Life is truly awesome. I'm not by personality a motivational speaker. I'm not Lee Ermey, the drill instructor in Full Metal Jacket. But I can share this with you in words. If you dream it, do it. Take a step. And if you dream something different tomorrow, that's okay. Take that step. I'm not at all religious, but if there's one thing quantum scientists have discovered, it's that the universe is far stranger than most scientists could have imagined. So if you dream it, maybe you were meant to dream it. And if you were meant to dream it, you were certainly meant to do it. Likewise, a few of you out there might be having the strange urge to reach out to us. Don't ignore it. Reach out. Maybe you were meant to help us. We're kind of like an awkward teenager outgrowing his clothes, and we need help. Researchers, guests, guest bookers, social media whizzes, video editors. I don't know. Whatever you guys think we need, we need it. I'm going to continue to develop this channel until the universe is done with me, and then others are going to keep it going. Well, so what are we meant to do with this channel? I think we're meant to bring attention to forgotten victims unsolved cases, give their families a voice. I think we're meant to shed light on cases involving corruption, cover-ups. We want to do it fairly, though. We want to resist the temptation to rush to judgment, to connect dots that might not actually be connected. You have to work at fairness. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your own interest. Yesterday, my partner Dave called me with the kind of breaking news that would put this podcast on the national map probably as big as anything any true crime show has ever broken. However, we don't want to jeopardize an investigation that seems to be in its final stage, so we won't break it till we're sure. If you see us go live at some weird hour, it means we're sure, so it's safe to break it. So stay tuned. For one family, justice seems to be finally coming. The case we are going to go over tonight makes my blood boil. It may or may not involve a cover-up, but it absolutely involves almost unbelievably cruel exploitation. It may or may not involve a murder. Let's be safe and say it does not. But it certainly involves behavior so dark and evil that it led directly to a very vulnerable young woman's death. Tonight, we'll talk to a special guest that's spoken with the family. Let's start, let's start with some clips on the, on the case first. Um, hold on one second. We've got him. All right. A 19 month long internal investigation has uncovered three former police officers allegedly had an inappropriate relationship with a woman who they met when she was a teenager. At least three police officers in Stoughton had inappropriate sexual relations with a young woman who committed suicide last year after becoming pregnant. That according to the department's chief on Friday at the conclusion of a lengthy internal investigation. Sandra Birchmore met the three officers as a teenager through the department's youth program. Fred says this is the first step toward justice, but only a first step. The Stoughton Police Department has released the results of this 19 month internal investigation. This investigation started when 23 year old Sandra Birchmore was found dead in her apartment last year after having committed suicide. The investigators determined those investigators also determined that Birchmore had been having inappropriate relations with three Stoughton police officers. Now, according to the report, one of those officers had known Birchmore since she was 13 years of age and began a relationship with her at age 15. A friend of Birchmore tells News Center 5 that she had a troubled family life and turned to law enforcement looking for people she could trust. 
these men knew who they were dealing with, an innocent girl who was just looking for love and attention. And she didn't have an appropriate male figure in her life because her father wasn't in her life. So these guys became that, but they groomed her and they used that to their advantage. They used her weaknesses to their Now that friend says Birchmore um, was pregnant with one of the officer's baby at the time she died. All three officers, Matthew Farwell, his brother William Farwell, and Robert Divide, they have since left the force. They have resigned. They are not facing any charges at this point, and they did not respond to our request today for comment. The district attorney's office in Norfolk County says it has found no evidence of a crime. Now, Stoughton's investigation also turned up possible misconduct by a military recruiter and a fourth police officer. And late today, News Center 5 learned that that fourth officer is with the Abington Police Department. He is now on paid leave while his superiors begin their own investigation. Okay, before I bring on your and my favorite investigator, Dave, and our special guest, I just want to give you a brief synopsis of the case. Of the case. Um, Sandra Birchmore was 13 years old when she enrolled in the Explorers program of the Stoughton Mass Police Department, a program which is designed for kids interested in law enforcement so they can interact with cops. She never knew her father, so she lacked male figures in her life. Maybe that's what drew her interest to law enforcement. She lived with her mom, her grandmother, and an aunt. All three of these women would die by the time she was 19. Sandra strikes me as the epitome of a vulnerable figure. She was small and cute and female. I've had other women in my life exactly like this that also went into law enforcement. And I think a big part of the reason is a desire to not feel helpless and vulnerable. They tend to be strong personalities, very determined, but made more vulnerable by their size and gender. They want to be able to protect themselves. And because they're sympathetic to their plight, they have a strong desire to protect other vulnerable people. So they dream of being a cop. But in the end, Sandra was betrayed, betrayed by those that are supposed to protect the vulnerable, supposed to protect her. At least three Stoughton cops in the Explorers program exploited her vulnerability and developed a sexual relationship with her. At least one had relations with her when she was only 15. They even attempted to share her with cops from other police departments. By the time she was 23, she was moving closer to realizing her dream of becoming a Stoughton police officer and was actually on the list. But she was also pregnant, allegedly impregnated by the cop who had begun relations with her when she was only 15, who had groomed her since she was only 13. On February 4th, 2021, that cop visited Sandra in her apartment in Canton. Yeah, that Canton. The cop's own wife was pregnant, and in fact, she would give birth the next day. Sandra's apartment was full of baby stuff. She was excited about the birth. No longer would she be alone in a world which had been so cruel to her. The cop visiting her was my, the cop whose name was Matthew Farwell. He's seen on surveillance entering her apartment at 9.30 p.m. We'll show it to you. He was the last to see her alive, according to his testimony. He told her the baby was not his and he didn't want her to communicate with him ever again. When she didn't show up for work for four days, a wellness check was finally sent. The Canton police, yep, those guys, found her on a chair in her room. Scarves were tied from her closet door to her neck. Her death was ruled a suicide. This ruling was overseen by the same DA that is prosecuting Karen Reed. While Sandra's pregnancy was confirmed, no attempt to identify the father was made. Cause of death was strangely not listed. At the very least, this poor, vulnerable girl was exploited while she was useful as a sex toy and then coldly cut loose in a way which drove her to kill herself, allegedly. I'm going to bring in my partner and our lead investigator, Dave McGrath, and special guest, Melissa Berry, or Mizzy, who runs a blog and channel called A Mixed Up Girl in a Mixed Up World. She also runs the Justice for Sandra Birchmore Facebook page. So let me bring these guys in. Welcome, guys. Evening, Kevin. Evening, everybody. Hi, right, Mizzy. Say, say a syllable, Mizzy, so we know we can hear you. Um, I didn't hear anything. She's, she's muted. That's why. Okay. I can't uh, hear you guys. Oh, you can. You should be able to hear us, and uh, we can hear you just fine now, ma'am. I just heard her there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you hear us now, Missy? I can't. You can hear me though, Dave. Right? 
Okay. Oh, you know what? Oh, Missy, go into your um, settings, right? Mm-hmm. And under under audio. Oh, there's my alarm again. Sorry, guys. Under yeah. under audio, you'll see the speaker and make sure you got it on the speaker that you want. Yep. Can you hear us now? No, not yet. Um, not yet. Um, can you hear us now? So make sure you're on your speaker that you want. Um, any other ideas, Dave? Um, yes. Uh, log out, Missy. Um, <laughs> Missy, log out uh, completely and re-accept the link. And when you hit speaker, make sure that you hit the hold, speaker. Is hold on. on. I'm trying to see if that worked. Can we hear you? Can you hear anything? Nothing yet? Okay. No, it didn't you. work. No. Nope. Uh, yeah, I'll log out. out. I'll come okay. back. I'll... All right. We All do right, need Dave, a tech... so... I was actually talking to somebody today who's a producer who would be willing to help us. I was like, great. Um, that's what we desperately need. Sorry to everybody. I was drinking. It's just uh, Fruit 2 uh, Good. Good evening, Kevin. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone hey, Dave. doing? So um, let's get let's get into the case since we had to, we de we've delayed things for a few minutes here. So um, how long have you known about this case, or what? Have, what I know you, I just I didn't know about this until recently. So mm -hmm. I know you followed it for a while. Yeah, of course. Um, it we I started to look into this as soon as Turtle Boy wrote about it. So I saw it on T Turtle Boy Turtle Boy blog. Uh, easy for me to say, and I immediately <laughs> said, just like the Karen Reed case, I immediately said, "Holy shit." Um, it's never what you think it is, right? And a lot of the same people are involved, obviously the Canton PD, obviously uh, Detective Sergeant Lank, who was the first person to arrive at the Birchmore scene, was the same person to arrive at the um, scene okay. of the Karen Reed case. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mizzy, can you hear us? The person to arrive at the Birchmore scene was the same person to arrive at the- um, um, Don't listen on Facebook, because Facebook has a delay. Yep. So if you can go to the YouTube page, Mizzy, that might help too. Um, the I'm YouTube page is has a delay. Yep. So we, yeah. yeah, she can hear us. It's just delayed. Yeah. If you close the live feed, Mizzy, you'll be able to talk. Just close the live feed, ma'am. Turn off your Facebook and your YouTube and just talk to us on this tab, StreamYard tab. Yeah. I, I think she can hear us. Just listen through StreamYard. Um, or accept this on your phone um, if you have an iPhone, and it'll automatically default. We can hear you, though, I think, so if you want to say something, Izzy, what you're working on. or Maureen Walsh, I feel like that language is odd for a discussion. If she's answering your question, she can effing hear you. I feel like that's a really strange thing to say. So sometimes you got to be a little patient, Maureen. This isn't 2020, yeah. you know. You're, it looks have... like you're a nice, nice young lady. I mean, I don't understand why you would use that language. That seems odd. Just, just be, just be patient a moment. Um, Missy has uh, done this. She has her own channel, um, but I don't know if she's done Streamyard podcasts a lot, so. Um, Maureen, was that you on the other line talking to Turtle Boy on the live show the other night? I think I recognize that vernacular. Let me give Mizzy a call. Let me give her a call. All right. And Dave, meanwhile, you can keep you can be entertaining yes, the I'm audience. Gonna, I feel like I'm a substitute teacher. I'm about to get hit with a fucking um, paper airplane any minute now. Uh, there goes Mizzy. Um, what's going on? Anybody got any questions? What you guys do so far this week? It's Monday. It sucks. Hey. Um, mute yourself, Kevin. So, Jill Maureen Daniels. That's right, Forrest. Yep. What's up, MJ? Um, who was it? Estrella? Who? Um, I've been talking to Jenny Holtzclaw for months now. Um, I'm ready to go whenever she is. A um, lot of interesting new information in the Sandra Crispo case to come in the next couple weeks with us, probably the next week. Uh, Brittany, I had VJ Day off as well today. Beautiful, isn't it? Victory over Japan. Thank God we beat the uh, imperialist Japanese today on this day. I think Rhode Island's the only people that celebrate it too. 
which is weird because it's a state that's known for a fucking big blue bug on the highway. That's about all you got here in Rhode Island. What's the news, Dave? Um, white paint. I don't know. Depending on uh, what news you're looking for, there's a lot of it. Um, Shamrock Sports Network. I am steering the ship. And I have been a boat captain multiple times. Um, MJ, thank you. Um, many, many people have reached out to me and said they've started the book and different portions of the book. And thank you. I worked so hard on it. New book, uh, sort of a follow-up, more of a personal sort of memoirs of how I investigated the book and all the things that went down in the investigation is the new book. It's called I've Got an Obsession. Comes out Halloween 2023. Thank you, White Paint. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, brother. Yours arrives tomorrow, Britt. Awesome. Come find me. You live like a block from me or something like that. I'll sign it for you. I want to hear more from Kevin, too. What's up, Ben? Hope things are good. Your Monday's been great. That's ridiculous. Um, Pre-order is available right now, Brittany. Yes. Dave, can you see if the library video in Kent was purposely deleted? Um, I can try. Um, I have heard many, many different things on that. Are you in Seattle, Barbara? I was in Seattle for a long time um, at Fort Lewis in Tacoma. Let's give it a shot. Mizzy, can we Sorry. hear you? Can you hear us? Hear her. Can you hear us? I guess she can't hear us still. She tested it out on her phone. She was. Yep. Best day of your life, Ben. That's right. <clears throat> Every day that you're alive, you're in the black, my friend. That's it. Um, you came in with nothing. Yeah. You're going to leave. I can hear nothing. through the phone. Awesome. All right. That's all we need. That's okay. good enough. I can, right. I can hear. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, Mizzy. You came in with nothing. Yeah. You're going to leave. I can hear through the phone. There's a huge delay, though. Huge delay. I can hear. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, Missy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's wicked delayed. Thank you. Missy, if you could just be quiet for a second, Kev. If you yeah. guys want to try talking and I could set up my phone. Yeah. To go through my phone. You can just, if you want to just accept the StreamYard link on your phone, that'd be perfect. My phone. You can just, if you want to just accept the StreamYard link on your phone, that'd be perfect. Okay. I just got to get up the hookup. To, I'll be back in a few minutes. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, miracle, isn't it? <laughs> so the thing about, you know, the. One of the, there's, there's some things we want to talk about in this case. Um, you know, one of the things that I asked Mizzy about, and she'll get into, I said, so she suspects that this is this is more than a suicide here. And, you know, you got to be really careful about saying that kind of thing, obviously. And, you know, it's, it's you know, you, how what kind of evidence actually is there? So one of the things that I asked her, I said, is there any evidence of an irregular investigation? Because uh, that could be a possible sign of, of some kind of a cover up, right? And one of the interesting right. things that she pointed out to me was that the state trooper. Now, this is these are the kind of cases that the state police take over. The state mm -hmm. trooper that was assigned to interview the cop who was caught on surveillance going into her apartment, probably within within an hour and a half of her death, uh, probably sooner. But with certain, it was the last text. There was a period. Um, that she didn't respond to a text at 11.30 and had responded to a text at like 9. So the cop had been in there. She either died right after he left or something more right. foul play happened. Um, so anyways, this guy is a Stoughton police officer. The state trooper that was assigned to interview him interviewed him in a parking lot. There's yep. no transcript of this. Nope. Okay. Well, that state trooper was a former Stoughton police officer. That's true. Yep. How does that happen? You know, I just, how does that happen? That, yep. just, that's just, I mean, you're, it's just beyond my, it's beyond me that the state police do things like that. You know? I mean, we just saw it. And with Karen Reed, Proctor is a good family friend and they let him investigate the case and just hope nobody finds out about it. Right. Um, yeah. This one is, we were talking about the Birchmore case all week or the last couple of days, Kevin, we were both like, we're so just emotionally invested in how awful it was for this poor little girl. 
how the fuck can we cover this in any kind of way that's going to be partial, you know, or, or balanced, you know, cause it's such a sad case. Um, it really is. It's, it's, it, it warrants so much more attention and I hope we can give it. I know that Barstool sports did a, um, uh, a season of the case on it. Season two, I was actually talking to the producer, um, Dave Cullinane, just before we came on, uh, on messenger, we were talking about it and we were talking about how little, um, uh, there's Cullen Ann right there in the uh, in the uh, comments, and we were talking about how little, uh, you know, just how hard it is to get anybody to work with you on this and get any kind of um, cooperation from people. It's just so difficult to get that in in this case. And for those of you, I see some people in the in the comments asking, "I want to learn more about this case." And um, I think the first thing we should show more than anything is that surveillance video because a video exists of Sandra Birchmore right before she passed away. And there's also a video of Matthew Farwell entering her apartment building, going into the elevator. And I want to see, I want you guys to see how he behaved and how she behaved right before her life ended, whether you believe it was by suicide or murder. And um, I think it's really interesting to see how Matthew Farwell behaves when he leaves. So this is Sandra here, guys. You know, she's glued to her phone. She's walking back and forth. She lived on the third floor. Um, I'll rewind that for in case people missed it. Um, this is actually my first time seeing this too. Oh, it doesn't, yeah. this rewind doesn't work on this, but uh, yeah, right, that's just fine. you're going to see Farwell coming shortly here. He's wearing a hood. It's during COVID. He's wearing one of those silly um, COVID masks uh, that didn't work. And it's, it's middle of winter, so it is cold. But look how big this guy is compared to Sandra Birchmore. There's Farwell there. This is when he comes in. And mind you, at this moment, Sandra Birchmore is pregnant with his child. And he's a married father and working on the student. This is how he leaves. I'll tell you, I'm sorry, man. I never wear a hood. I don't care how cold it is. Are you friggin' kidding me? Yeah. That just looked like someone that didn't want to be caught on surveillance. Yep. Am, and I, am I wrong? You, I mean, who, this is this is a big cop who spends a lot of time working outside, and he's covered up in a hood like that just to, to come inside an apartment. If nothing else, if, if it's the coldest day of the year, you pull the hood, you, you take the hood off as you get inside the apartment. Right. That's it just, just it just shady. looks it, it just looks so terrible, you know. And it just looks the way he rushed out of there. And again, she didn't. There was no text messaging. There was no. And again, just on the forensics part. Now you have uh, Nicholas Garino is a former trooper who he pulled the forensics off of Farwell's phone. He was part of the forensics investigation on this. He knew nothing about forensics forensics during this case. He, he was just a neophyte, um, couldn't do anything to, to get any kind of useful information off the phones, um, Farwell's phone. But of course, in the Karen Reed case on this. So um, he's the absolute authority on digital forensics, does it, uh, you know, he, he can't be argued with, so. Uh, it's another little funny side story, ridiculous side story, and how it relates to Karen Reed because it's some of the same people involved, like Detective Sergeant Lank, who was the first person uh, to show up at um, 34 Fairview for um, Karen Reed's, um, or excuse me, the John O'Keefe uh, killing. And he, he wasn't again, the first, here but he was involved called in. in. Yeah. yeah, he was called in, excuse me. And he was at one point, he was right. the highest ranking guy involved. Uh, there was a lieutenant there. Um, he was He was off that day and he was called in. And he was called then, right? So I mean, he may have been on call. I'm not trying to make that sound more suspicious than it is, but right, he very well may have been been on call. We don't know, but it's yeah. just interesting that he was involved in this and then that. And mind you, too, another little interesting. Yeah, this guy detail. is that guy is sneaking in. That guy is sneaking in. Yeah, I'm no. sorry. Look at him. He's got his head down. The yeah. surveillance video is really the clincher. It's like if you know anything about human nature, intuition. What does your gut tell you about what this guy's doing here? You know what I mean? It's just. It's scary. Um, and the way she was found, she didn't hang herself in a in a way that, you know. Uh, hi, Missy. How are you? Good. How are you? Can Sorry you about all that technical difficulty. Uh, here we are. No worries. You're worth waiting <laughs> for. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you guys tonight? Oh, it's Great. working. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I guess we want to ask you. If, uh, go ahead, Cap. Sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. I guess we want to ask you, um, you know, it's. It's 8.30 at night. We don't want to keep you forever. We're sure you got things to do, but we wanted I'm all to- good, you guys. I'm yours for the night because I, uh, I, I'm i up to like four in the morning every night. Yeah, so. I'm the same way. I'm completely Working obsessed. on this case. Yep. 
how'd you get involved in it? Did you, did you know Sandra or you're always interested in true crime? Did you see the story and go, holy shit, this doesn't sound right? Um, in 2020, above? I became a, um, a vlogger, blogger, whatever you want to say. And I started interviewing people after George Floyd, just so people can have more of a dialogue and conversation. You know, I'm mixed. My mom is white. My dad's black. So I wanted people to conversate and it, it's kind of evolved because I wanted to deal with, you know, police corruption, but not, I, I don't believe all police are corrupt. I don't believe, you know, mm -hmm. there are good cops. I know some good cops from when I used to work at, be an assistant manager in stores. So I wanted to show kind of, you know, how everybody could come together. But this was police, like I started getting into doing, doing interviewing families of those who've been murdered. And almost every case I covered, there was police corruption in the cases. And mm -hmm. I heard of the case back around when, you know, the, the report came out from Stoughton. And I was like, I have to like cover this case. But I had other cases going on. So I kind of just kept, it was always in the back of my head, you know, like I would think about it every few days and it. And then my friend said to me, hey, what do you think about the Sandra Birchmore case? And her mm -hmm. and I for like two weeks just started like, that's all we talked about. And she said, we need to do something. She said, you make a web, you make a Facebook page. I'll make the um, change.org petition. And I said, okay. And she's like, you run the page. Cause she, her son was murdered. So she couldn't really help with me. And mm -hmm. so she, she did what she could. And we've slowly grown the page and we've been able to piggyback on the O'Keefe and Reed case mm -hmm. because it both takes place in Canton and, right. and and with the Stoughton police too. Right. And if you followed our page, you know that obviously I'm I'm very pro Karen Reed. I believe there was corruption. Um, oh, I do too. Kevin drives the speed limit on that, and I thank God for him because he keeps me balanced. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm interested. Just give me a quick, you know, give me the thirty thousand foot view for you of the case. Like, for what me, do you I personally believe she was murdered. But, you know, there's always that 1%, 2%, whatever you want to say, that she wasn't. And even if you don't believe that Matthew Farwell murdered Sandra Birchmore, he mm -hmm. drove her to whatever happened. So yeah, if, if you believe she did commit suicide and say somewhere down the line, the facts come out that she did, well, he drove her to that. These mm -hmm. men you know, groomed her, assaulted her. And I'm sorry, even though she was an adult at 23, I still look at it as the assault continuing from age 15 to 23. It was all part of one. It wasn't like, oh, she was 18 and the assault stopped. No, it continued. Yeah. And I, I felt bad because I saw this young woman that nobody was fighting for. You know, her aunt did, um, file a lawsuit against the four police officers yeah because there is a fourth police officer joshua heel he yep. used to be a stoughton um control officer but he moved on to be a police officer in abington yeah and he's involved in the case also he's so he's he's in, he's um on the lawsuit so i personally me personally i think she was murdered that night but mm -hmm. even if she wasn't these men drove her to it and especially Matthew Farwell. If we could give just, uh, we, we obviously got a lot of um, people list watching live and they may not know soup to nuts, everything in the case, like, like I do and like you do. So she was a girl who was super vulnerable. She had lost her mom. She didn't have a father in the, in the, in the household. She was yep. a police explorer. For those of you who don't know, there's, you know, such a thing called explorer programs where young Young people can get involved with police work. They can go to mini academies. They can do ride alongs. They learn about the law. There's a million cases across the country of police explorers having um, there's, you know, complaints about sexual abuse happening all over the country. I found them from Oregon, Alaska, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. They're just everywhere. These kids being abused by police officers. And Sandra was a part of an explorer program. Yes. And she met Robert Devine, who was a former deputy chief who ended yep. up losing his job for a uh, he was involved in another sex uh, scandal, if you will, with a woman named Tiffany Overstreet, who was his mistress. 
and also used his police power to go after her too. It's a yes. totally separate thing, but destroyed her life as well. Um, so you have Divine, you have the Farwell brothers, you have the animal control officer named Joshua Heal, who I'm told, um, I was just told by a couple of commenters that he's actually off the roster in Abington now. So maybe he's not on anymore. I'm not sure. That must uh, be recent because I looked like two weeks ago and he was still on the page. Okay. Um, interesting. So Josh Heal, I don't know if he's been deposed or if, if there's ever been uh, any kind of interviews with him. I, yes, I, there I, have been. He was interviewed. Um, he, okay. he was interviewed as a witness to begin with, and he thought he was just a witness. And he told a lot about the Farwells and Divine. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then he realized that, oh, wait a minute, I'm part of this. Because they actually um, took DNA off the couch in the, um, the animal control office. And it was Sandra's? They, they never said what came of it. But, mm -hmm. but that's, they did. They did investigate that. What do you know? Let's just go by one by one. Give me okay. a little bit of backstory on, to me, the biggest villain in all of this may be Divine. I don't know, it's hard to say, but Divine had so much power. He ranked, he outranked all the officers involved by, by a multitude. Mm -hmm. And he was second in command of the whole town. I mean, tell me a little bit about Robert Divine. I just want oh. to interrupt real quick, Mizzy, just something interesting. Dave, that Mizzy was telling me earlier today about Divine is that he also was the school resource officer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where, where have we heard that before? Robert we'll be Gooley, yeah. Robert Gooley, yeah. Well, well, not only that, but we'll be investigating that this week in New Hampshire. Yeah, it seems to be that the school resource officers just, we've seen it across a multitude of cases, yeah. Missy, where it's always something to do with these school resource officers. Yes. Yeah. It's, 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 it's drawn to those positions of power, and for some reason, nobody seems to suspect it in in the police so they yeah. just allow these people to go into those positions and there's no suspicion there's no protection it's kind of like the catholic church sending the kids into the priests i mean it's yeah. it's um it's just it's enraging but i'm sorry missy why don't, why don't oh, you answer the okay. question I didn't um, mean to, yeah. to answer his question um i had two witnesses come forward one of them is um in the stoughton report and they were she was interviewed by um the guys from the case um uh podcast yeah, yeah. so Kirk you can't hear her in her own words what she has to say but yeah. her and i you know talk more than what she said on there and she said something very interesting she said that robert divine also groomed the um follow brothers but she he didn't groom them to be you know to be victims of him he groomed them to be predators hmm Wow, and another witness said, it, she also said that he also gave them a lot of power. Like they would run the class, the, the, um, um, the classes sometime. He would put them in charge because he, he, he ran, he was an, the officer and he also ran the after school gym program at the school and the, um, the explorers program. So he had so much interaction with young people. And wow he gave them a lot of power and so that made me think like it really hit me when she said that because i was like it's right it's true i mean like they mm -hmm. were probably already a little you know off but he saw that in them a lot of times you know pedophiles they they know oh, yeah. they they know oh, yeah. they can pick, you know they can pick each other out and oh, yeah. he he groomed them to be to join his club and yeah. That is not uncommon at all, Missy. In fact, I have ran into, uh, I've had many, uh, you know, that's something that I wrote about in depth. If you don't know my work, I've written mostly about pedophiles and they almost always find each other and they groom other people to sort of take their mantle, if you will. Yeah. Um, so that is not, that is not uncommon at all. Um, could you tell me about a little bit about Matt and, um, and Billy Farwell? Um, what what, have, what do you know about these guys and, and, and some of the things that they've been involved with over the years? Thank you very much, Tom. I've been trying to gather information more. Me before was working on reading all the reports and trying to you know, gather re reports. It's kind of hard to get everything that I want from um, the Massachusetts State Police. But mm -hmm. I did I did recently just get the report last week, but it's there's there's a lot of holes in it. We can get into that later. But um, 
the I had a witness that came forward the, this weekend too, along with the other person, and she said these the, the Powell <laughs> brothers were assholes. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. At, I mean, and she said that a few times, and that they just they they were on power trips, and you know, it didn't help that Divine was giving them power, but people didn't like them. They were assholes, and that's that's what I got from them, from her. And and you know, the 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 what the girl that was groomed, she kind of alluded to that too. That you know, they were. It was like they they were. They were the mean kids in school. And that included Divine. Like he was yeah. like one of the, the mean kids, you know, like they were the, the jocks and everybody else was, you know, the dweebs underneath them. And the Farwells acted like that too. Sounds like a familiar family in Canton, the Alberts yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, they, I know they went to the military and they're they're bomb technicians. Yeah, both of them uh, were EOD techs. Yeah, I did yep. learn that as well. And going back to Divine real quick, did you, I found it interesting to know about his uh, mistress a little bit that he had on the side. Were you ever, ever able to get in touch with Tiffany and talk to I her? I haven't reached out to her yet, but yeah. she's definitely on my list to, to get to them. I did reach out to her um, for this episode and I, I didn't get anything back, but I was very interested in talking to her and getting her insight because this wasn't divine. He had a wife, but he slept around. He, yeah, he had an issue when Tiffany came forward and said, Hey, you know, I'm cheating with him. It was a big scandal. And then what happened is he used basically his police power to go after her, search her house illegally, take things from her that might've been able to prove that he was having a sexual relationship with her. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak on that a little bit? Um, yeah, he also like just made it look like that she was the one who was going after him. And mm -hmm. um, I, I know just a little bit about that. That's just he was very aggressive with it. And I think his wife was involved in all that, too. Yeah. So it wasn't yeah. just him. His wife was, in, I believe, was involved in the abuse towards that woman. And they ruined her life. I believe yeah. she changed her name too. Somebody told they me just, they, they totally destroyed her life. You can't, you have to find her on like a deep search. Like you can't, yeah. you can't Facebook her. You can't find her that way. So that's very interesting. And um, a lot of people are asking in the comments. So I figure we'll skip here. There's been a lot of disagreement discussion on where exactly Matt and Billy Farwell are now. Where, where, where are they now? Um, Matthew Farwell is in um, Easton, I believe. Okay. And um, Billy is in, um, he is working for the TSA in Baltimore. Okay. He's working at Baltimore for the airport. Um, I do want to say something about Divine to more background mm -hmm. on him when it comes mm -hmm. to children. Mm -hmm. He always had kids around him. Like he would mm -hmm. drive them around in his work car, in his personal car. Kids would always be hanging out at the police station with him. Um, the 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 woman I spoke to who who was groomed by him said she she went in there one time and she was wearing like a low cut top and she was twelve years old like this girl was like infatuated with him it was like her first yeah. crush and yeah. he instead of doing what a normal adult male would do and mm -hmm. say no you're too young for me and, you know do it let her down easy but he played into it he liked it he 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 got off on it. And there was right. one time she went into his office and she was wearing like a low cut top and this other officer came and yelled at her to get out of there because what she was wearing. So he was, people knew what he was about there. And that's what makes me angry too. None of these other officers stopped him. Right. Right. You Nobody know, intervened. Everybody no. knew that divine was, had a tendency to go after underage girls and there's Sandra yes. right there. So. Yes. Um, and look and at really, her. she looks very young. Even like, even right. if you look at the pictures from when she was um, 23, she still looked like she was, you know, 18. She does look very years. young. Very, very, very young. And I know me, you know, I'm 39. It's hard for me, Mizzy, to even take a girl seriously who's like in her mid 20s. You know what I mean? Like, as you yeah. get older, it's kind of hard, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I, I just turned 49 and I like, I joke, I'm like, well, as long as he's old enough to go drink and then i'm like what am i talking about we can't yeah. we couldn't even sit and have a conversation properly right, you know, right. just want to mention something um busy so the the picture that you're painting of divine 
and how he was grooming people to kind of really say and taking these kind of jobs not only with with this explorers group but also as a school resource officer it really strongly suggests there probably might be multiple victims so there are probably victims out there listening to my voice right now yes that are understandably afraid to come forward but hopefully they should and they should reach out to us or reach out to you definitely and uh you run the facebook pit group mm -hmm. the sandra uh, justice for Sandra Birchmore. Yes. So please reach out to Mizzy there and she'd be happy to talk to you. You can reach out to Dave. You can reach out to myself, whatever, however you're comfortable. But I think you'd be more comfortable reaching out to a woman. So um, I just, yeah. there has to be people out there. There has to be multiple victims in here. There has to be. I think they should um, interview every person that went through that program. Every person, whether they're a girl or a, or, or a boy, because boys might have seen something. And they can also talk about how he was towards them, how he he was very mean towards the boys, but he wasn't towards the girls. They're not going to interview. That's the whole thing we're talking about here, right, Dave? They don't want to know. That's the point of that's the reason you do half-ass investigations because yep. it involves the police, and you don't want to. They don't want to know. That's we. I mean, whatever happens in the Karen Reed case, whether she's innocent or guilty, it was a half-ass, shoddy investigation. Yes. That was that was not done because of incompetence. It was done because they didn't want to investigate something that yes. might involve other cops. And right. even though it's a murder investigation, we're not talking about investigating, you know, a DUI. This is this is serious yeah. shit. And I think we see the same thing here. Sending a Stoughton police, a former Stoughton police officer to do the first interview. Come on. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And again, yeah. just to piggyback on what Kevin said, because a lot of people reach out to us every day. And that's the um, that's like half the reason why we do this show and yep. and they message me and i can't believe the amazing conversations i've had with victims in the last couple of weeks if you went through this explorer program and you know anything about robert divine and what he's done to groom young children reach out to us we yes. want to talk to you we want to yep. expose this even further yes. um you know, turtle boy did a great job I'm, I'm very partial to Turtle Boy. I'm also very partial to Kirk Minahan in the case. I'm huge fans of those guys, so it's hard. My judgment's always clouded, but we want to take it even one step further if we can for this young girl here, whose life is over, and she was terrorized by men that she trusted in uniform, who were allegedly um, above, you know, who who should have been above things like this, and, and yes. they they destroyed her life. So even if they didn't murder her you know, for whatever opinion you have on that, they drove her to the point where she committed suicide. And how far along was she in the pre pregnancy, Mizzy? I, I see some discussion about that. Do you I, know? I've heard different things. I, I think it might have been around three months, but it might have only been like two. I've heard different things, so I'm not 100% sure. I can check with her cousin and find out the exact amount, but I think it was two to three months. And what is the um, one qu one more question I want to ask you too, mm -hmm. just so we can get the players. So we have Matt and Billy Farwell, the brothers. One's in Northeastern allegedly now. One's down at TSA. Yeah. Um, I did check in with TSA to see if I could get any discussion on him. I didn't hear anything that that he was working there. Uh, he might he may have been fired. I was told actually. Oh um, okay. For somebody who would really know, and apparently they got wind of this investigation and they fired his ass. And it's somebody who I would trust with that information. They've worked really hard on this case. So um, okay. that's the case good on TSA. But we do have one of them living in Northeast and now. Yes. And the, the, I wonder if the state police have any interest in talking to him or if it's just blown over or what. They've but, already talked to him. They've interviewed him a few times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They interviewed him. Um, his first interview, Matthew Farwell's first interview was, um, I, I don't know, if I can't remember if it's the day, the 5th or the 6th. So she, we believe she died on the first yep. and, and on the fourth, um, her work called in for a wellness check because she hadn't shown up to work, hadn't communicated with anybody, didn't call in. So they were like, what's going on? We don't know what happened to her. And from then that's when they went in and found her. So the fourth, I believe it was either the next day or that the following Saturday. So Thursday, they find her Friday or Saturday is the day when they did their first interview. Their first interview with him was in a parking lot of a school. Now, if you or I had been the last person to see somebody that was found yeah. deceased, we wouldn't be interviewed in a parking lot. And I get it, you know, uh, okay, 
first contact with him. He's a fellow cop. You don't want to jam him up. Okay. But mm-hmm. they were also at that point had people coming to them saying, you know, he, he's been with dating her for a long time. He lied to them and said they only started sleeping together since 2020, which wasn't true, obviously, because, you know, she was 20, 23 or 20, yeah, 22, go, you know. So it's like he flat out lied to them. And mm-hmm. Why didn't they sit down with him and do a proper interview? Because they didn't want to. Right. Much yeah. like the Karen Reed case, it seems like they just didn't want to. Yeah, yes. It's infuriating. By design. By Go design. Ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Mizzy, um, I just wanted to talk about the deleted messages. We talked a little bit on the phone today. Yeah. Um, after he left his, her apartment, he, he told them that he deleted everything, like every contact he had with her blocked her on his phone, deleted every text message, every, you know, Facebook message, everything. He basically deleted her. And I find that interesting that yeah. they had brought, see this, this is why I, I think he did, it goes more towards he did it. They, they, he claims that she was so distraught for them breaking up. They broke up off, they were off and on again anyway. Just like a month before that, they broke up and uh, people she worked with when they interviewed them, they said, oh, their their relationship was on and off. And, you know, her and her, the baby's father were talking about, um, you know, visitation rights and stuff like that. And she said that that she's it's not going to continue. The relationship wasn't going to continue. So why all of a sudden is she going to kill herself? That's my question. Sure. We talked today about the possibility of getting some of those deleted messages back. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, kind of like what happened with it in the Karen Reed case. Yeah. You mentioned if she could get rich cream, but obviously money is difficult to be able to afford to get that. Um, but I mentioned to you that if we can get the, those forensic images from the phone, we might be able to take care of it for you. I know someone yeah. who might do it. We may be. The only problem we have, and I want to just say this now, because if we can get the phone, we can get the we can, we can pull forensics on it. We we definitely can, but uh, we need to get in possession of that phone somehow. Yeah. So if um, her phone, okay. They the lawsuit they will have discovery, mm-hmm. so they should be able to at least or at least get a copy of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all we need is a copy of the imaging. Yep. Yeah. Copy yeah. So the, the forensic imaging, and then any data analyst would be able to look through that yeah and we have someone that's extremely reputable but i think we'll do it i'll pass that on to the family i think her cousin is on tonight i can't see the chat because it's on my phone um but i'll pass that on to make sure you know her and i will talk about that anything we can do to help um and i want to touch base with you real quick on heel um he was the animal control officer in stoughton Yes. And, and how did he lure Sandra in? How, how did he ended up connecting to all this? Um, William Farwell introduced them together and um, they had an interaction and basically she got a cat from him. Mm-hmm. It was off the books. That's why they went and took DNA off the couch. And that's why they, they pulled the records from um, the control office because animal control so they could get information on the cats because the cats were off the books or cat i can't remember if it's one cat or both of her cats but the the cat was off the books so it was a cat that heel would have what saved from the streets or something like that he would have had to have reported on it probably and yeah like that okay yeah it was totally like basically the cat did not exist in animal control system Okay. Yeah, that's okay. So he gave her a couple cats off the books, allegedly. And then did he start having sex with her as well? No, I think they only had that one interaction. Okay. And, but they, they remained friends for a while. Mm-hmm. So I have to read the report. I haven't read the Stoughton report for a while. So mm-hmm. I need to go back and reread that, especially now that I'm seeing the other, po- the reports that I'm seeing so I can compare like, you know, put all the information I'm going to make like, you know, those murder boards that, you know, they make oh, yeah. at police stations. Yeah. I'm making one in my room so yeah. I can put all the puzzle pieces together. I to... did one uh, for my book. They're, they're, they're tough, tough work. If you need any help, yeah. let me know. 
Um, Definitely. I, I can use all the help we, I can. And we do have the forensics for her phone, right? The um, forensic data. They did. They did the forensics on her phone. I would assume that the family will get that too. I just wonder if anything was deleted on that too. Um, no, they they had all the text messages and everything from him. That's how they found out Divine was messaging her on. They were messaging on um, Facebook, and he had a secret account, and mm -hmm. his name was um, went by the. Um, Riggs from Lethal Weapon character. That was his name. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But it would be interesting if there was even just one deleted message, like from him saying, I'll be over at 9 30, because that would be proof of a crime. Yeah. So he wouldn't, he wouldn't, you know, I'm saying if he managed to get access to her phone, which he could have in that situation, he wouldn't have gone and deleted all the other messages. There'd be no way to do that, but he could delete. I mean, it would be too time consuming to do that, but he could delete that one incriminating message possibly, especially yeah. where he was trying to, you, if you've seen the surveillance video, he obviously was trying to hide the fact oh, that yeah. it was him. Maybe, I don't know. I, they, they didn't really, they didn't really get into detail about that. They just they said look. they had, yeah, like you said, it's by design. It, they, 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 they didn't look for deleted messages, yeah. which you're not going to find what you're not looking for. Exactly. But maybe we can find them if we can get that data too. Yeah. Like I said, I'll pass that information on to the family. I'm sure they would love all the help that they can get. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what this show is. That's literally why we started this show. Yeah. Really quickly, too, um, some people are asking about the timeline. So um, Matt Farwell in that surveillance video enters at 9.14 p.m. and exits at 9.34 p.m. So he's there a total of 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, I work in law enforcement in the in the in the prison system for the most part, um, and I see when people commit suicide, um, they sort of tie things, you know, in a way because they have no real resources to like hang themselves normally. Yeah. And when I and when I read the police report for Sandra, it looks like that's how she committed suicide as well. She didn't hang herself. She actually did it almost in a pressure sort of way. And I yeah. found that to be really interesting as to why and how she would do that. Um, I, I I wrestle with that myself. Um, the one big case that people compare to it is the Robin Williams suicide. Yeah, Robin Williams, yeah. But Robin Williams put his belt in the door jam, and he wasn't sitting on the actual floor. He was That's slightly right. elevated. To Dan. And Sandra wasn't. She was sitting on the actual floor. <laughs> Yeah. They do say in, in the report that um, it was so tight around the, the ligature was so tight around her throat that she did have bleeding in her coming from her mouth. Yeah, I so find she, it hard for her to do this because yeah. she didn't. It wasn't a doorknob. It was a door handle. Right. So, yeah, so she would have had to put a tremendous amount of pressure for that handle, not the bend. It's sort of a delicate. So yeah, because it would slide. I, I personally think it would slide forward. But they said it was the, different officers said different things. And that's one thing I want to mention. But they said it was one said it was very tight around there. And it was and it was very tight around her throat, which I don't know. I, I don't have that type of handle, but I do plan on when my friend go to my friend's house, kind of role playing with it. Obviously, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it, but please don't. <laughs> no, I'm not going to, and she'll be there. I just want to see if it's possible, like yeah. to see if it's actually possible. Um, I, have, I have seen suicides like that in prison, um, a, a bit like that, but they have very little resources in prison. You know, you yeah. have to be really, really dedicated. Like Aaron Hernandez committed suicide that way um, by greasing the floor and putting his 270 pounds worth of body yeah. pressure on that throat area. And that's what that's what Sandra would have had to done, but she would have also had to balance the door and the handle. I mean, when I think about it logistically, which I've been thinking about since Friday when we when we we're going to do the episode, I just that's a really a bridge too far for me. Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think she committed suicide. I don't. I personally don't either. And yeah. this video is demonstrating how it can be done. Yep, and. Um, well, that's if as if somebody's behind you, which is, I don't know, maybe the likely uh, case. Uh, I wonder if the feds have been brought in on that. 
um, maybe we should reach out to DOJ and see if we can uh, FOIA um, some some documents and see if they've ever looked into this case. Yeah, yeah I've heard be... rumors that this case might have been folded into the Reed case just because of if there's mm -hmm. corruption at the DA. Mm -hmm. There, it would, you know, a, a girl dies from 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 you know was molested by cops and you know mm -hmm. and they're covering up another crime type deal thing mm -hmm. so i've heard that but it, i haven't heard anything concrete yeah that would be so i'm just allowing myself to dream for a minute i'm just yeah. imagining that uh the alberts go out in cuffs and we also get matt farwell um and Robert Devine, the Farwell brothers and Devine, like as like an opening act that day. Imagine oh. that all in one day. Oh my God. That's uh <laughs> sorry, so guys, is, this, is this similar to how they how you think it was done in this scene here? Ms. Possibly. E? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But I've also been thinking because I re-listened to the case, um, mm -hmm. the 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 series that they did on her. Mm -hmm. And in the last episode, it's like one of the last things that they say. They said that there might have been semen in her or DNA in her underwear and mm -hmm. that there was a necklace that might have been ripped off. So I was also so I've been also kind of thinking, well, what if he did it while they were having sex? Right. Is it so possible it, that they were? It would have. Doing... She wouldn't have. I mean, she wouldn't have seen it coming then, mm -hmm. you know. And I find it weird that it happened the night before his wife gave birth. Gave birth, yeah. So he was really under the gun to do something about this right now. I think that's... It's, it's in the report that um, a, a witness said that William told his wife about him and Sandra. Mm -hmm. So, and he denied it. But she was probably like, and I don't mean that she's involved. But she was probably like, you need to get rid of this girl. Meaning she needs to get rid of the baby. You, not not meaning to go kill her. Right. I'm not saying right. that. But, you know, she's, I'm, you know, she, I'm thinking it from the, woman, the wife's perspective. She's ha she's about to give birth to their third child. And, you know, you find out that this other girl's pregnant. And, and no, you need to get rid of her. You need to take care of this. I want her out of our life. And I'm not meaning that she insinuated to go do Okay. What I think was done, but right. she was just like, "You need to, you need to break up. You need to get rid of her." And, he, and Sandra was pressuring him to sign the birth certificate because he didn't want to. Right. So yes. they, Sandra was putting a lot of pressure on him about the baby. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a perfect storm, you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't there an incident when where he pushed her too, according to her yes. one of her friends? Yes, and he. I don't know if it's that. I think it's this time where he said to her, the, the person said, he either said, I hate you. I want you to kill yourself or I hate you. I hope you die. So that, wow. you know, it, it, wow. yeah. And it yeah. does look, I see somebody makes an interesting comment in that video. That video really just does a, a million, makes me think a million things, but he does look like somebody who's, who's kind of on a mission. You know, yes. like like the wife just yelled at really him. Really does. He's it's having disturbing. a. It's disturbing, and he, his wife just gave him an earful. He's got a kid being born the next day. <clears throat> he's got a mistress on the side. He's been grooming since she'd been, you know, a little kid, and it's just, you know. And his he, work he, found he, out he, about Sandra. His work found out about Sandra. Sandra was in a tiff with one of her friends. Her one of her friends loaned her about two hundred dollars. And her yeah. friend wanted the money back. Yeah, I wanted to get to that. Thank you. Please, please go ahead. Yep. Her friend wanted the money back. And she kept saying, I, need, I want the money back. I want the money back. And Sandra kind of blew her off about it. She might have given her some money. I'm not sure. And then she wasn't, Sandra wasn't answering her calls. So she called the police, the Stoughton police to say, station, and was kind of just to report it. And they were like, ma'am, that's a civil issue. You're going to have to go to like civil court for that. She yeah. said, well, why don't you tell her boyfriend, Matthew Farwell, to get his girlfriend to pay me back my money? And then wow. Sandra called her like really fast. So mm -hmm. her work, his job was finding out about what was some things that were going on. It was getting messy at work, messy at home. He had a baby coming. 
I think he was under pressure to get rid of her. He had motive. Definitely. And this is, that's one thing that, that I want to mention. They, they asked him for DNA and they asked, they did ask him to take a polygraph. He refused. Of course. Yeah. Um, but I, my question is they, he was sp- suspected to be the father. He was the last person to see her alive. They could have got a, get, gotten a judge to, if they showed that video to a judge, a judge yeah. would have signed for them to get DNA. Right. Where, where is the DNA? I noticed that when he entered the door in that surveillance, when he entered the outside door, he had a card. So he was obviously a regular visitor there. And I, th- I think I read that he actually had set her up at the apartment. But so he had the access card. So he was a regular visitor there. Did he normally come in hooded like that? Or was this the only time he did that? Well, it was uh, cold. It wasn't. Yeah, it, you know, was, like I said, I never, I would never. It was a Nor'easter in, in, in uh, New, uh, Massachusetts or yeah, New England. It was England. snowy. It was, it was right yeah, in the it was, a nor- it was a big storm that night. And he just, he comes in. He's, he's deliberately facing away from the camera he's he's got the hood he doesn't take the hood off before he gets in the elevator or when he gets inside the lobby wouldn't you i mean it's just it's so yeah i mean obviously it's a little less suspicious than if it was in july but still to me i don't i just you know to me you're a cop you used to being outdoors um you're a big strong guy you're you're not afraid of the weather you park out front you come in that's it i mean I, i would it's not like he was walking walking to that apartment from downtown or something like that. It looks you know? like you're it look it looks like you you're a police officer, you're a seasoned investigator, and you know that you should probably cover your head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and the way he comes out, he he boogied out of that there. He he like made sure to get out of there as fast as he could when he got off that elevator. It's no if it's not so much the back, the entrance. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nizzy. Go ahead. If you look at the back like the back of the video, you can see how high the snow is at that point. And right. that was before the snow got really bad. And my question is, now I'll ask you two, because you're both guys. Say you were you were dating some chick, whether it was, you know, cheating on a wife or whatever, you were dating a chick. Would you drive to her house in the middle of a nor'easter to break up with her? No, you would text her, right? call her on the phone. You wouldn't right. go, why, 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 why? Why? Right. You're having, you lost your glasses. That's how yeah. passionate well, they were. broke earlier and it, they keep popping out, but it's totally broken. Um, Especially like your wife is due to have a cesarean the very next morning. I've had, yeah. we've had a scheduled pregnancy, uh, a scheduled birth uh, here in my house, me and my wife. And we were going crazy the night before packing shit. Mm-hmm. The last thing I was thinking about is going out in a nor'easter. You yeah. Know? I want to find out too if he was coming from work because people keep saying about the, how far away it was. Cause she was, she was in um, the Newton Wellesley hospital hospital. Yeah, yeah. So in a, in a, you know, in the Nor'easter, it would take a while to get there. You know, it, right. it's only usually about 20 minutes from her house, mm-hmm. but you know, in, in that weather, it would take a lot longer. So I'm wondering if he went after work. I'll tell you one thing. There. If you live in Canton and there's a blizzard, lock your door. Seriously, do not <laughs> yeah. do it. Something always Canton. happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. funny too. Not funny, haha, but it's their crimes happened almost exactly a year apart. You know. Yeah. Because yep. she was the first and he was what the 20, 28th, 29th. 29th, yeah. 28th 29th. and 29th. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's just crazy. Just crazy. The similarities of these two cases and you know, and in the, the most glaring similarity, Kevin Mizzy, is that I just think that whoever investigated this showed up first on the scene, had a narrative, and they were going to protect that narrative at all costs. That's what I see more than anything. Oh, yeah. They were calling it suicide before there was any investigating. Right. I mean, I, I they've probably seen it all. So I get I get it's like a, I try to play devil's advocate with that. I kind of get that. But what I've always been told. I watch a lot of crime shows and mm-hmm. you are supposed, especially in an under ten, unattended death, you're supposed to walk on the scene and think it's suspicious and then gather the information to prove that it was not a suspicious death. Well, they got the surveillance. So somebody was saying that there's some, somebody was doing the job and saying there's something suspicious here. They didn't just go in and say, oh, suicide. I mean, so it's like in Canton, when in Canton, the Karen Reed case, when somebody was collecting the blood. Right. Yeah. You know, there's always someone that has an inkling to do the job, but then right. somehow it gets squelched. 
the Canton police did an okay job with this, but I was telling you this afternoon, Kevin, if you look at the reports from these guys, these, there's five, there's four reports. There were five officers. First, my question is, where is the fifth officer's report? Because every other officer um, wrote a report for Canton. Um, none of them say, one of them says it was a scarf. Two of them say it was a strap. And the, the fourth one says it was a lanyard, strap, string, or rope. You are grown ass men and cops and you guys can't come up with which one it was. Right. That's suspicious to me. Right. You so can't many, tell <laughs> the difference between, oh, I'm sorry. One of them thought it was a belt. I'm sorry. They said a belt or a strap. Um, they, you can tell the difference. A scarf and a belt do not look anything alike. Sure. I could see them miss because some people think it was a strap to like a gym bag. I could see mistaking that for a belt. But you can't, a, a strap to a bag or a belt mm -hmm does not look like a scarf and it doesn't look like a string and it doesn't look so like we a still ring. don't have any we don't really have agreement from the responding officers exactly what she used to kill herself we don't know nope That's no wild. yeah okay and the, the massachusetts state police it's totally redacted and the uh, other by, by um officer us uh, trooper done he was pretty much the lead investigator um, and officer, uh, Sergeant Trooper Fanning was his immediate boss. And he was always, whenever Farwell was interviewed or anything, his fingerprints were all over it. And he was a former Stoughton cop. Do we trust the medical, the medical examiner on this, on the report? Um, we? well, the I medical have... examiner also said John O'Keefe had no, no injuries consistent with yeah. the beating. So, yeah. <laughs> Can we and trust them? No, not a hundred percent. And I have, but I haven't seen the the autopsy, and that's that's the one thing with Massachusetts. Yeah. It falls under HIPAA, HIPAA, so they don't they they don't release it. A lot of other states where you can get autopsies, yeah. you might not be able to get everything, but you can at least get like the autop just the the written part. Right. It's a and crazy law too, because I mean the person's dead. So yes. we're not, I mean, they're dead now. So we're not yeah. violating anything, you know. Um, it'd be certainly helpful for people like us who are trying to get the narrative straight. And it, to me, it's just another tool to really cloud the, you know, to just make things more murky than they need to be. Definitely. You know? And I tried to FOIA the, um, the, the AMT who came in and pronounced her dead, but that they said that also was Falls under HIPAA. HIPAA. And I was like, in my head, I was kind of like, well, can't they redact, mm -hmm. redact most of that stuff? Like, I'm not saying the autopsy. I understand the autopsy. But with that, it's just a report. You know, he would just leave him where, when you got there. And I don't know. I, I thought that was weird. Because I would have loved to have seen what he said she was strangled with. Interesting. Um, this EMT, is it a he or a she? Do you know? It's a he. This he... Um, many people have reached out to us and said, Hey, we watched the show at, you know, EMTs have reached out to us, um, to Kevin a lot specifically. So if you're watching this or if you get a hold of this and you were the person who showed up that night to Sandra Birchmore's apartment and found her dead, re reach out to us. We, we yeah, definitely know, we, I would, I would we need to know. It. Yeah. The public needs to know. Yes. And if something really happened to this poor girl, her family needs to know. So, um, definitely. if somebody murdered her, so. Um, if that person ever gets wind of this or someone who knows them, reach out to us. Totally anonymous, reach out to us. We'd love to know. Yeah. Um, Lauren, right. I would assume that the she's got a question about wasn't it around her neck? And I would assume it was just because she had been dead for four days. So yeah. I don't think there was any reason, any there wasn't any reason to attempt to revive her or anything like that. So I yeah, would assume no. yeah, you go in there and you just start right. taking pictures and do an investigation. Yeah. So there ought to be pictures that would show exactly the position she was found in and what was attached to her. Right. Um, One of the things I find eerie about it too is there they said that 
um, the only part that's not really blacked out in, on the, the Massachusetts State Police report is that the, her phone was next to her and it was like a 12 inches from her hand. Like, so she wouldn't have been able to reach her phone. And it was like six inches from her leg. And I find that like creepy. Cause it's like, if she didn't do this to herself, that was almost like a last form of torture being like, you can't, you can't get any help. Cause she wouldn't have been able to reach it. Right. Just out but of isn't, But if, when, I, when I watched the scene you mentioned in The Wire, wouldn't it have been, if, if someone was going to murder someone like that, wouldn't they just murder her possibly in a different spot of the room or, and then just move her to near the closet door to do that? But he might not, have, if he did it, he might not have known that she was completely gone. Because if he was there that only like, it takes a while to strangle someone. She, it, Is it, it also takes possible really she dropped it? Is it so also possible she dropped the phone? in the process of it, of killing herself? Possibly. I mean, it's, that's possible, but I just think it's, it was out of reach. Like I would think if she dropped it and kill it, it would more land, would have more landed in her lap. Because if she was, I don't even think she would have had the phone near her. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, what? she wasn't calling anybody. She wasn't texting anybody. Like she was in the, before he had gotten there, she was talking to her cousin. She sent her cousin the text. So it's, it's she initiated the conversation with her cousin. She was also talking to her coworker. And that was at nine o'clock through Snapchat. And the last Snapchat went unanswered. Do you and think her, it's... <clears throat> go, ahead. go ahead. Her cousin was going through something. So mm -hmm. she, like, her... Sandra used to check on her all the time and she knew that she, in her heart, she says that if Sandra would have called her because she knew she was upset if she was alive, like she would have called her to check on her. Like if she, when she texted and she knew that her, her, her cousin was upset, she would have called her. She wouldn't have just left her not have nobody to talk to. So that's, and that happened, I believe, at 8.51. Do you think it's possible that he may have killed her and then staged this scene? Possibly. Hmm. Yeah, seems like the maybe the likely scenario if he did kill her. Um, very interesting. Very, very interesting. I, I, I mentioned this to Mizzy today, that it almost seems worse to me if she committed suicide from her, in terms of her suffering because of well, what he did to her, to make her feel that low that she actually wanted to felt so alone in the world that she wanted to take her own life knowing yeah. that she had a baby that's almost to me more cruel than killing her to, to make her feel that betrayed and that cut off it's just it's it's horrific to think that you would do that to another human being that you've she's known for 10 years since she was 13. i mean she's been just, tortured tortured her whole life by these guys just passing her around and yeah just exactly brutal. Something that you just said, um, he was the constant, you can think of it, he was the constant in her life. You know, her, her mother died and her grandmother died really close together. And then her aunt died in 2019. So he was the one constant in her life. She was, he was the, her guy. You know, she wanted them, he manipulated her. She thought they were going to be together. She thought he was going to eventually leave his wife. And she another reason why I don't think she did it is she was so excited that she was going to have a baby. She wanted to have his baby. She wanted to have a baby. That's why she was buying all kinds of clothes. She just bought a car seat. Um, she was getting all kinds of stuff delivered to the apartment. To me, that's not somebody who, who wants to just go go and kill themselves. Yes. And I, I, I tried to kill myself when I was 13. And sometimes it can be spontaneous. Like for me, well, I was depressed. I had depression. And mm -hmm. that morning I woke up and was like, all right, I'm going to do it. You know, mm -hmm. so that can happen. It does happen to people. But I just, she was so excited to have the baby. And it's not like they hadn't broken up before. Right. 
right? Thank you for sharing that. I've been very open about my own mental health issues. Thank you so much. Um, oh, reach, yeah. out to me, reach out to me anytime if you want to talk. Um, same. Off same. Right here. I, I um, have everything on mental health issues. So. so am I. So am I. I answer day or night if it's a mental health thing. And I'm, I'm getting an interesting comment uh, from mm -hmm. someone named Brielle. I just want to bring this up. Um, I, apparently, the officer who first found her, this person seems to have some inside information. Um, his name is Ensley Cotard, uh, mm -hmm. Kent High School graduate, 2003, and is also the current school resource over at Kent High School, resource officer, oddly enough. But uh, he was actually the resource officer when she when she died. Okay, and he was the first person to find the body, apparently, too, according to he this got, person. He got a call from um, the, the uh, Sharon... As, as um school resource officer there was never like a 911 call it went mm -hmm. from pol the police officer to police officer and they asked them to go look at it and three officers um brady kotar and um yeah was it lank no he showed up after he was the supervisor okay. um yep. yenton y yenton something like that yenton oh. um and they called him and said we found her and then blank and the uh, detective McCourt showed up and they, they started investigating and then the, they called in the Massachusetts state police. I wonder if they knew who she was when they got there, like just based on the reputation of these guys all passing her around and right. You know, talking about her at drinking parties and stuff like that. And maybe, maybe and it was well, well, well known, obviously. I mean, they had all, groomed her at least four of yeah. them including the former deputy chief who is just for some reason I, I i hold him as responsible as anybody even though he wasn't here that night i mean he's supposed to be in a leadership position he's supposed to be uh exactly you know, the utmost of professionalism teaches officers the right way and instead he's grooming young girls and you know at the very least pushed this girl to suicide and at the very worst he might have murdered her and he's yeah. walking, walking walking free right now um, and we're going to try groomed and the Farwells. he groomed the firewalls to be predators, which, which again is not uncommon. I've written about that in the past on different cases that I've looked at. One case I looked at forever that I know the guy groomed other men to younger boys, younger men to, 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 they do that for whatever reason they bring people into this stable. It is a tale as old as time. I've seen it many, many yeah. times. So, um, Mizzy, do you have anything else Kevin for? No, um, but feel free to talk about your channel and some of the other things yes. you're investigating. And uh, you, you're welcome to come back anytime now that you got the technology down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll just have to do it on my phone. Yeah, if anybody wants to check me out, I've interviewed a bunch of different people. It's um, a mixed girl in a mixed up world. Um, it's better go on my Facebook page. And if you go to the Justice for Sandra Birchmore, I post a lot in there. So you can just click on that. Um, anybody listening, please come to the Justice for Sandra Birchmore. Oh, I do need to mention something. We are having a rally for her on Monday, so a week from today, at 12 o'clock at the North Norfolk DA's office. Oh, I'll be there. I'll be there for sure. So, so 12 o'clock, um, August 21st, it's 12 to 3. Mm -hmm. Come join us and let them know. And we're inviting Karen Reed supporters too. This is It's about Sandra Birchmore. But it's also there's more than just Sandra that this this DA needs to go. This that whole office needs to be gone. Yeah. You know, I don't know anything about that DA, but I and this is really unfair to say it. But when I look at him, one thing that's obvious is he didn't get to that position through charisma. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how he, you know, so yeah, was he hoisted into that position through connections or, you know, and maybe he's got a super resume or something. I don't know. But when I just look at him, it's like this is not. The guy you expect he doesn't have the charisma to be in the job like that yeah and just the way he carries himself and everything so i mean i don't get it but so yeah come join us come join us we need as many people there as we can get i'll be there wear, wear blue because blue was sandra's favorite color absolutely i'll live okay. stream from there maybe we'll do a little video okay mizzy thank you so much uh thank you so much for your work on this i thank couldn't you. appreciate it more um reach out to me anytime thank you definitely same here okay. thank you guys for having me Thanks, awesome. Missy. It was a pleasure. Um, Dave, so what do we have in the works for the rest of the week? I know I may have to do a special one on Thursday, um, depending on where we're traveling. Yeah, I have I mean, one. We're, we're opening up um, a couple of new branches to Yellow Cottage Tales, and this one is from the Austin branch. However, the woman is a is um, 
she is a transplant from Gainesville, Florida, and she's connected to a, a case down there, a an unsolved murder, and she's going to have the mother on. So she wants me to do it on Thursday. I got I, I told her Thursday might be tough for us, but we're still trying to work that out. Um, we might be in Maine or something, so yeah, we might have to do it from the road. <laughs> yeah, um, we're definitely going to do a show uh, Thursday. We're going to be out traveling, doing some stuff for the doc chasing people down like we always do um do we have a topic know. from wednesday or um what were we gonna do i don't know i'm sorry ask me offline i'm so, my mind's still blown from talking to mizzy um, i feel like there was something we were gonna do but there's obviously this one case that could blow any minute but we can't really mm -hmm. talk about it until yep. you did yep. you did great investigative work on that and hopefully as soon as it listen if that case blows at three in the morning wake me up we'll just we'll go on yeah. right away when this case blows we will be live immediately um and great work by our crack investigator aaron morshauser as always if you guys don't know aaron um she's just such a stud for us behind the scenes and um she's uh, anything that i get done she she's like in the background just feeding me everything i need and um i couldn't do it without her and uh, i really couldn't do it without her just like i couldn't do this without you i couldn't do anything without her I and bet she's, Aaron's been never never been called a stud before. Yeah, that's true. But in this case, she is a stud, and yeah, uh, she does a great job. And Brielle, you should reach out to us because it seems like you know a lot about what happened with Birchmore. And if you do, you should reach out to us. And I'm just looking at the comments. I apologize, Kevin. Yep, that's okay. We're willing to come back and talk about this anytime. And as we said, anybody that's been a victim to a school resource officer. Uh, in the area, but anywhere or to the Explorers program or anything similar in other police departments, because I think it's obvious it's difficult for anybody that's been a victim to those kind of things as a youth to reach out. But if, if you if, if you feel like law enforcement is against you, you, man, you must feel just terrified the idea of ever coming out and saying anything. So um, if you do, please reach out to us and we'll we'll discuss it with you. We won't do anything that you don't want us to do. Right. So. But we do. But we, but we do. I mean, we're not going to give up on that Birchmore thing. Like, we're going to hammer that thing to the ground because it's so fucked up and it's so crazy. And this poor little girl, you saw her face. My God, how could you how could you not want to give up everything, you know, that you're doing to fucking do something to, and, to try and get to the bottom of that? You look at the picture when this girl is like 13 and she's I don't even think she's five feet tall. And these dudes are over six feet tall. And there they are looking at this 13 year old girl and already sizing her up and grooming her and then even i even when she was 15 she looks like she wasn't much more than five feet tall just and it's just to exercise that kind of power and manipulation power. over somebody just you know animals. they're just animals they should be in a box forever just buried under a jail and nobody ever see you again they're just animals you, you know you, when you think about the isolation that he did to that girl assuming he pushed her into suicide if you're a friend of this guy, if you're a family member of this guy, mm -hmm. you need to do the same thing to him. Isolate him. Let him let him know what it feels like to, mm -hmm. to feel that isolation like nobody in the world gives a fuck about you. Right. I mean, just, just, you know, if he hasn't if he didn't commit a crime, then he doesn't deserve to go to jail. But at the very least, he, what he did to that girl, he deserves right. to be isolated forever. Right. You should never be again allowed. And I don't care about this guy. I, sometimes people say, like, oh, I feel bad. Leave this person out of it. Leave this person. I want this guy shamed every day of his life, every day of his fucking life for this, what he did to this poor little girl who yeah. had no father, no mother. She was the most vulnerable person on, on earth. And you fucking monsters, you know, you, you, you just, you destroyed her. And at the very least, like we said, she committed suicide over it. The very worst, you fucking murdered her. And yeah, we're not going to let that die. We're, we're not going to let that die. All right, guys, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we're, we're planning on doing a show Wednesday and Friday, but it's subject to change. Um, this is going to be, there could be breaking news went from Dave any time on this, on the case that we really can't talk about. And I may be doing Thursday night about a Gainesville, Florida murder. We I have a meeting tomorrow night with the brand new Las Vegas division of Yellow Cottage Tales. And I'm, I'm happy to announce we'll be bringing back Tom Faust. If you look at our older videos, Tom is a professional radio man who used to host his own show, who did videos for me a, a while back. And he's going to actually host those shows with the, the other Las Vegas 
people that'll be on there. We'll be talking about true crimes, but we got some really good personalities. One of them is a professional comic, um, but she's obsessed with true crime. And she's a very lively, entertaining personality. And me and Dave will still be on board too. But these guys have yeah, fantastic personalities. And we'll be bringing on Chicago, Austin, Texas, um, New York, and Los Angeles eventually too. Maybe if we can get Tom Fleming to open up a North Carolina division. Uh, that we've been trying to get him to do that. That'll be fantastic. So, Dave, anything else you want to say before we nope. say goodnight to everybody? Love you guys. Um, awesome community that we've created here. So many people reach out to me every day, want to talk about cases, and um, that's what we want. We want people to talk. Talking has created, a, you wouldn't believe the things behind the scenes that we're working on for you guys. Just stay the fuck tuned. Stay tuned. Thank you very much, guys, and I'll see Dave tomorrow. <laughs>